Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Ignat and today we're going to talk about sandboxing your code on Linux and SecCom. Just to let you know, this session is pre-recorded because my home broadband is not that great to give live presentation, but I, I'm hopefully online uh, when this presentation is being streamed, so I'm happy to answer all your questions you have during the presentation or after the presentation. So thanks for tuning in and let's go. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I work at Cloudflare. I do mostly performance and security. Uh, I'm from London. Uh, I'm also passionate about cryptography and enjoy low-level programming. So Linux kernel, bootloaders and other low-level scary C stuff. Okay, to understand sandboxing, let's talk about Linux system call and seccom first. Uh, well, on modern computers, we don't run our code directly on the hardware, right? So we, uh, on modern computers, we use operating systems and like with Linux, Windows and Mac OS being uh, one of the prominent examples. And so we run our operating system kernel on top of our hardware and then we run our application on top of the operating system, which kind of separates the whole computer computing into two environments. It's like application run in user space and the operating system kernel runs in kernel space. And it's like a, mi a middle layer between application and the hardware, which provides useful abstractions and services. So system calls then. So if you run your application on some kind of operating system kernel, at some point you need to communicate with that. You need to request some services from the operating system or request access to some hardware uh, from the operating system. And for that purpose, the oper operating system kernel provides an interface to do that. So system call is basically this interface. It's a set of functions you can call from your application to request services uh, on behalf of the application. So yeah, system calls is just a well-defined interface between user space application and the operating system kernel provides many features like, for example, hardware independent abstractions. Your application do not, does not need to care if it runs on a, like an old spinning disk or on a modern SSD. Also, it doesn't need to know the details of your network implementation. So yeah, the operating system provides your basic high level services like file IO, network access, and also like time sound and something out, some other services. This architecture also allows the operating system to enforce uh, different security models like, like access control list permissions and uh, privileges between application. And because we also run multiple application on the same hardware, the operating system kernel is responsible for some resource management to ensure that hardware resources are shared fairly between all the applications. So what is SecCom then? SecComp is, is just yet another system call. It's an operating system interface. And it provides a way for an application to notify the kernel which other system calls the application intends to use, and sometimes which system call the application will definitely not use. And then the kernel uh, enforces this system call policy provided by the application. So, so basically, SecComp is just a tool for an application to confine on sandbox itself. And remember, seccomp is just a tool. The documentation says it's not a full sandbox solution, it's a tool to create sandboxes. So let's go back to our example. So in this case, the application can use seccomp system call to provide its system call policy to the kernel. Think of it like as a contract between the application and the kernel where the application promises to the kernel to use only a subset of system calls and probably never to use some other system calls. And because it's a contract, if the application later breaks that contract, the kernel is free to take action. So it usually penalizes the application by terminating it. So why would applications actually do that? So if they don't provide any policy, uh, the, SecCom, the Linux kernel will never penalize the application, but why would the application would take the risk uh, to providing that policy if they can suddenly, for example, violate it in, in the future and be abruptly terminated? Let's 
consider an example. So imagine you're writing a simple clock application and you're writing it on Linux to be able to use SecCon. So what does the clock application actually need? It only needs to know the current time. So you can actually define uh, a SecCon policy for your application and pass it to the kernel and your policy would be, hey, I'm just a clock application and I will only use uh, the get time of day system call because on, the clock only needs to know time, right? And when your application is executing at some point, it needs to know the time, so it uses get time of day system calls to get the time from the kernel. And because it's within the allowed policy, the kernel will allow that system call to happen and return the time. But imagine at some point later, because you wrote your clock application in a low level, uh, unsafe language like C or assembly, someone hacks your application and that C achieves arbitrary code execution. Then the attacker will probably use that application to collect some sensitive information from your system and they will try to send it to themselves over the network to steal it, right? So they will direct the application to send the data over the network, so the application will, will most likely use the send system call. But because the send system call was not part of the original policy, of the original promise by the application, the kernel will not allow it to happen and immediately terminating the application, thus like terminating the hijacked application and preventing the data leak. So that's why seccomp is very useful. Seccomp is not very important for normal behaving application, but it's very effective if the application is somewhat exploited uh, for mostly from, it's a good way to protect from arbitrary code execution attacks. So sand, sandbox your applications. Okay, how to actually do that, right? Uh, let's consider, let's jump into code now. So let's write a simple command line application. If you're familiar with your name, a command line tool, it will be something similar. So our application will use the similarly named your name system call to get some uh, static information from the, your local operating system kernel and print it to the user. Let's see how it works now. If we compile this code and run it, we will see that our operating system is Linux, which is great because we can now experiment with SACOM further because SACOM is a Linux only feature. Now let's try to sandbox our application. So we will modify the code and add just one function, additional function before the main logic, which we'll call sandbox. And here is the function implementation. So let's define our policy here. So actually, to illustrate that seccomp is working, we will define, we will actually prohibit our own application to use the uname system call, but we will allow any other system calls. So to do that, we need to write this scary listing. Unfortunately, seccomp rules are a quite low level feature and they are written in the BPF programming language. And uh, so you, if you, the operating system provides some useful macros for that, but the whole rule still looks very like uh, assembly. So, yeah. But the gist of the scary listing is this part. So in this case, what our rule says is that we allow every system call within our process except the uname system call. And if the application tries to use the uname system call, we will block it and instead of terminating the application, we will instruct the kernel to return an error code, e net down. And finally, in our sandbox function, we need to actually apply that policy or enforce that policy by using the seccom system call and sending our, our seccom filter program to the kernel. So let's see how it works now. Uh, if we recompile our modified source code, and try to run it, we will see this. We see uh, that uname system call failed and that network is down. And we know that seccomp is working because of uh, two reasons here. First of all, uh, there is no way the uname system call can return network is down error because basically uh, 
on itself, you name system call doesn't is just reading some static data from your local operating system kernel. It doesn't need any network access. But because our application receives that error code, we know be, that we hit our seccomp rule. And secondly, what we're hitting with the error code is the error path in the application. So the application has an error path defined where it just prints the error to the user and we see the output. And to actually to print something to the user, the application has to use other set of system calls, notably the write system call. So we know that other system calls are allowed because the application was able to actually print the error code to us. So yeah, uh, it, it's quite simple, but it's definitely not simple to write seccomp rules by hand. So it's quite low level assembly like language. It's hard to write, it's hard to review, it's hard to debug and, and update. So even our small example, it contains a quite large uh, and rather unreadable uh, code. Whereas consider if you need to, to define a more complex policy for a, for a very complex real world application. If you write it by hand, you also need to be aware of some low level details. So uh, seccomp rules, uh, BPF rules, are, do not operate on, seccom, on system call names. They rather operate on system call numbers, which is internal representation in the kernel. And to deal with seccomp, seccomp number, system call numbers, you also need to be aware of the architecture because the same system calls may have different numbers on different architectures. And there is also some other quirks like setting the no new privileges bit for the process you want to sandbox and the description of this is buried very deep in the, in the, in the second man page. Luckily for many complex things, there is a high level abstraction library and the second is not an exception. So we can actually rewrite similar policy using the high level Leap seccomp library, which is actually even recommended on the seccomp man page. We will modify our policy a bit. So usually uh, just returning an error code if the process violates its, its uh, seccomp policy is not great because you still give the chance uh, uh, to malicious code to recover from the error and try to bypass or do an evil thing any other way. So it's usually better to just terminate the application, which we will do here. So instead of returning an error code, we will modify, we'll still prohibit the uname system call, but we'll tell the kernel to immediately terminate the application. And actually that huge uh, manual BPF listing can uh, be boiled down to three small statements with the high level library. So first we define the default action. So we, by default, we tell the kernel to allow every system call. Then we add our specific rule with, with a small statement. We say, but we prohibit the uname system call here. And if the application tries to use it, we just terminate it. And notice here, we can just use the uname. We can reference the uname system call by name and we don't have to deal uh, with numbers. So leapset comp will resolve it for us. And finally, we, again, we, we pass the compiled policy to, to the Linux kernel using the wrapper around the seccomp system call. Let's see how it works now. So we will recompile again our modified source code, but this time we need to also link with the seccomp library because we used it in our code. And if we execute the system call, we see the bad system call message. Uh, Notice here that the application did not have the chance to print the error now because it was immediately terminated when it tried to use the uname system call. So that's why we don't see the uname failed message anymore because our policy is more strict. Okay, this is all well and good. But the problem with two previous examples, we actually had to modify the source code for the application to add sandboxing support. But it's not always possible. So imagine like uh, if it would be a live presentation, this would be a show of hands question. But think of if you're a developer or you know the developer, think of, of the following. If you're a developer, you have your new project 
you know sandboxing exists and you know sandboxing is the most efficient way to protect your code from potential security vulnerabilities introduced in, in your code. So how many developers think like this? So most likely I will write bugs and security vulnerabilities. I should sandbox my code. Of course, not many, right? Like if you're a developer starting a new project, you have so many other priorities and it's usually like, uh, oh, I, we have to deliver the primary functionality first, we have to deliver the MVP, we have to do something else, 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 and we'll think about the security later, which is a typical case. Also, there are some proud developers out there which will probably even never admit they will write bugs or security vulnerabilities in the first place. So. Yeah, this is not an option, right? So here is the inherent problem with SecComp, that SecComp applies the defined rules of policy to the current process. And it's basically the model is that it is expected that developers themselves will add sandboxing support, support into their code. And there is actually no external interface to apply SecComp rules to a running process. But on the other hand, you have these other people like operators, sysadmins, or SRE who run that code in production, and they have all, and they would really like to sandbox that code uh, to have better security, but they have almost no control over over, over the second policy because they have no access to the source code, or even if they do, they are not very familiar with the code base, etc., etc. There is also this way the this small set of application everyone runs, which are like closed source proprietary tools where, where source code is completely unavailable or they're just some kind of third party applications, which should be sandboxed by default because you don't even cannot even audit the code, but you don't have any means to do that. So with SecComp, there is a gap, right? So on one side, you have the develop developers of the code who have the ability to sandbox their code, but they are most of the time they are not incentivized to do that. On the other hand, hand you have the operators, sysadmins, and SREs who are incentivized to sandbox their code, but they don't have the ability to do that because they don't have access to the source, uh, for example. So this is where no code sec comps comes into play. So it would be nice that you could can apply a, a second policy to any process on the Linux kernel, even without having to have uh, to having to have to recompile it or even like some having to have access to the source code. And turns out there is a solution. Uh, so you can do that with system D. So if you run your code through system D, you use system D as a service manager. If you dive deep into the system D documents, you can uh, define so-called system call filter directive. So you can supply a list of permitted system calls uh, to system D and system D will inject, convert them to a second policy and inject that policy before actually starting your service. And if the process later, later will violate the policy, it will be terminated with 6s signal. Uh, you can read about this more in the systemd documentation. So let's see how it works. Let's go back to our original non-sandbox version of our tool, which is just basically calling your name and print the result. So yeah. now let's try to run this tool from system D. Uh, so we can actually use system D run to simulate the, uh, to running our tool as a like ephemeral system D service. And we see it runs fine. So we still see our output and system D also prints that the application or the service exited with uh, successfully with exit title zero. So all is fine. Now we can try to sandbox our code. So we can actually out add our system call filter property and supplied a deny list uh, to deny you name system call to the uh, to our application if, if we run it we see that it's not printing any results anymore it, and we see that system did tells us that the application was actually terminated with a signal which is what we expected 
and uh, now to apply our custom second policy we didn't need to modify the uh, source code for the my OS tool and we didn't even have to have access to the source code we just operate on the same vanilla binary we can actually simulate our first policy uh, where instead of terminating the application we tell the kernel to return a custom error code and we can also simulate this with systemd we have to add yet another property system call error number in and down and now we see similar behavior as our very first example uh, with SECOM that the tool is actually able to print the result uh, we expect that you name it system call failed with network is down error code and but the process itself is not being terminated it just exits with an error code which is the way how we prog programmed it in, from the start so great this is all well and good why don't we just use uh, system d to sandbox any code on our system it's possible but there is always a but right and there is a small print uh, if you read further down the system d documentation you will notice this line that some system calls notably exact v exit and some others are implicitly allowed they are always allowed and they don't have to be listed explicitly and even though you tell system d to prohibit the the system call they will be still allowed because this system d uh, sorry this system call these system calls are needed for system d to actually function properly most of these system calls are okay except exec v so exec v is a quite dangerous system call let's consider why like why ex blocking exec v is good and why you should try to do it if your application if your application logic doesn't need uh, this call so most application don't if you, for example if you're not writing a, a shell so let's remember our clock application example so we remember that the second is the most effective measure to protect our code from arbitrary code execution attack so what, what does an arbitrary code execution attack look like? So for example, if, you're, if an attacker is able to exploit your code and make your application malicious, uh, they will try to expand their capabilities of execution by directing your application to actually use execv system call to run some other application. And most of the time it's a shell. So the, the attacker just need a shell access to your system and they then the attacker can issue arbitrary comments and do whatever they they want. So this is the most common path for arbitrary code execution exploit. So exploit the application and make it run execv system call and replace the application code with the shell. So blocking execv is quite handy eh, to protecting from this kind of attack. That's why we develop our own sandboxing solution, which is, uh, we call it just a sandbox tool. Uh, it's a toolkit to inject custom seccomp rules into almost any process without any access to any source code. And the toolkit consists of uh, two pieces. It actually follows the system D approach uh, to allow to sandbox any code on your system with no code changes, uh, but takes it one step further. So the toolkit contains two pieces. One piece is a shared library, which is designed for dynamically linked executables. And the other part is a launcher for statically linked applications. And the advantage is that toolkit can block any system full, including execv. And it works on binaries written in any rank, any programming language and it works in on proprietary binaries and the tool is open source so you can check out the source on github at this point you may be like what A shared library you said we are talking about zero code uh, seccom support doesn't a shared library implies we need to add some code to use it in our application well no because it's a bit special so let's go back to our toy you name like tool uh, which prints the currently running operating system and which is non-sandbox version so it's like vanilla tool 
to sandbox our uh, our command line application with our new cloud for a sandbox toolkit all you have to do is <clears throat> run it like so so we do two things here so we preload our send uh, uh, our uh, library from our Cloudflare Sandbox Toolkit into the application process space using LD preload and then we configure the desired second policy using an environment variable. So in this case we configure a denialist policy with only one system call you name. And when we run it we see it behaves as expected. So uh, <clears throat> when trying to do uh, trying to call the uname system call our application is being uh, terminated immediately by the kernel and we know that because it even doesn't have a chance to print the error message to the console so yeah it is a dynamic library but it's magic that you don't have to use it in your code all you have to do is to somehow link it into your process address space so some people don't like the ld preload approach and sometimes actually LD preload approach is not usable because it has an exceptions uh, in Linux. So to work around the LD preload thing we can use we can actually patch the compiled executable and add our sandboxing library as a permanent runtime dependency. So if we do that we don't need LD preload anymore and we can run our application anytime just as is and we, we, what we need to do is just to define the environment va variable with a desired second policy and notice here we we patched the executable compiled executable with no access to the source code and we still get our result okay but what about static binaries so if we recompile our original application as a static binary, we will see that the LD preload approach and, uh, does not work anymore. That's because for static binaries, there is no runtime linker. That means linking dynamic libraries into the process address space does not work anymore. For this specific use case, we have the other part of our uh, sandbox toolkit called sandboxify common line tool. It has the same configuration interface through environment variables and all you have to do is to run your application through the sandboxify launcher. The same way probably as we would run our application using the systemd service manager. And this way we can enforce custom second policy on static uh, uh, on processes spawned by static executables. So in this case we see that again uh, the application was terminated immediately after it tried to use the uname system call and wasn't able to print anything to the console. So yeah, all you have to do is to replace the LD preload directive with uh, our custom sandboxy file launcher, which is part of our toolkit. So in a nutshell, uh, Cloud for Sandbox tool is quite easy to use and it has a very simple configuration interface. It's configured via environment variables. The default and preferred mode is to actually supply your policy as an allow list. So anything, everything in the list is allowed, but everything is not in the list is, a, is, is denied and the application will be terminated immediately if it tries to use any system called not in the allow list. Uh, the more flexible but probably less secure approach is the deny list, which we uh, saw earlier, is that every system called is allowed by default except the ones in the list which might be some kind of dangerous calls or whatnot also there is a third environment variable called default action so by default if your application violates the uh, configured second policy it will be terminated but you can instruct the kernel not to kill the application and actually allow the system call to happen but it just log that the attempt has been made this is very useful for like early discovery stage where you're working with some kind of new executable and you're not exactly sure even which system calls are being used. So you can run your application in so-called permissive sandbox where you just monitor which system calls it the uses uh, the application uses, or you can actually use this mode to verify if your second defined second policy is not too tight. 
uh, and you're blocking some legitimate syscalls. And yeah, and the toolkit itself, as I mentioned before, consists of two parts. Uh, it's the first part is Leap Sandbox SO, which is a shared library. It's useful for sandboxing dynamically linked executables only, and you actually just need to preload that library into the process address space, either using the LD preload or actually patching the executable uh, directly. And the other part is the Sandboxify command line tool, which can be used on both statically and dynamically linked executables. And uh, to make use of it, you need to launch the executable through our custom launcher. And at this point, what many people ask, so why do we even need the, uh, the first piece, uh, the dynamically link, the shared library Le Leap Sandbox SO? If, we have, if the launcher can be used on both statically and dynamically linked executables, why not just leave the launcher and never use the shared library approach? Uh, and the answer is they're different. And to understand the difference, let's, from a like 1,000 feet view, review the process startup uh, stages. So when you start any process, when you launch any executables, what usually happens, there are two major stages. The first stage is some kind of runtime in it. So every code has some kind of runtime. If you write in C, you have the C runtime. If you write in Go, you have the Go runtime. It's, uh, if you're writing some scripts using an interpreter, language you have some interpreter runtime and then you have the actual main logic right so in this case if you use the sandboxify approach to inject custom second rules the rules are injected before the run usually before the runtime in each stage happens but if you use the leap sandbox approach the rules are injected after the runtime in its stage but why is it different? So what is this runtime in it? So runtime in it, regardless of the language you use, is, is basically a, a set of system calls which are never used afterwards. So that's why it's in, in it. So this runtime sets up some uh, resources, uh, process memory, map, etc., etc., and it uses a lot of uh, obscure system calls to do that. But most of these system calls are never needed in the main application logic. And here is we have the advantage of Leap Sandbox because it's usually the second rules are inserted after the runtime in each stage. If you are using the preferred allow list approach, all you have to allow is uh, all the system calls from your main application logic. But if you use the Sandboxify approach because it happens before, because the enforcement happens before the runtime in each stage, you actually need to allow all the system calls both from your main logic and from the runtime in each stage, which is usually a lot more. So you're basically you're allowing uh, some system calls which your main logic doesn't need. Uh, and if you don't do that, uh, you, you cannot start your application because uh, the runtime in each stage will just crash. So let's see a concrete example here. Let's go back to our toy, uh, you name like uh, uh, tool. So if we now, uh, we will change the policy now for previously in our examples, we use the denialist approach where to prove that seccomp is working. But this time, what is the minimal allow list we have to allow for our toy application to function prominently? Uh, properly and if you use the leap sandbox approach turns out you only have to allow for system calls for application to function properly so you have a very tight sandbox here if you run the same application using the uh, sandboxify launcher because of the runtime in each stage a uh, c runtime in each stage for for, for this specific application you need to now uh, now to allow 13 system calls uh, to run your application. So it's four system calls versus 13 system calls in the allow list. So yeah, with uh, dynamic library, a leap sandbox approach, you, if you have a dynamically linked uh, binary, uh, you can end up having very smaller allow list. Thus, uh, 
uh, greatly reducing your potential attack surface uh, by disallowing many other system calls your main logic doesn't use. And that's basically it. What I had for today, here are some useful links. Uh, the first link is a link to the uh, second man page. It has a lot of low-level details and quirks I've been briefly mentioning in my presentation. Uh, the second link is this, uh, the official repository of the libsecom library uh, we discussed today. And also, uh, the libsecom library is actually used under the hood in the cloud for a sandbox toolkit. The third link is uh, the uh, link to the systemd documentation which describes how to uh, inject seccomp rules uh, into any code with systemd. And finally, again, we repeat the uh, link to the our Cloud for Sandbox toolkit. We hope that you find this toolkit useful, you will apply it to your, uh, uh, to your application and provide some feedback to us, and even better, some pull requests and more functionality. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it for today. Now I'm happy to take any questions you have in the chat. See you and stay safe. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining my presentation. I try to answer all the questions in line, but there are still some building up. So I'll try to attack them one by one. Uh, let me just publish the first one. Yeah, so Al asks that it's not unusual and unusual for the complex applications to use read, write, send, or receive system calls. How do you protect against those? So the general idea around SecComp is you try to come up with a minimal allow list of all the system calls your application need and to prohibit all other system calls. In worst case, uh, like blocking execv is probably even good enough because uh, execv is quite dangerous and is the main tool the attackers will use to uh, get arbitrary code execution if, if they will be able to exploit your code. So even if you just block the exact V and your application logic does not need it, and it doesn't need it unless you're writing some kind of a shell, so it's a good idea to have it in place. Like consider a, a very famous uh, code execution exploit in image tragic, uh, image processing library. So let's say if you were executing uh, this code in a, like a seccomp environment most likely you will be less vulnerable to the kind of attack and like probably an image processing library doesn't need to execute any other binaries i hope okay uh, to the next one so rastam asks is lib sandbox being distributed by distros no, because I just pushed the code today on our public GitHub repository. So I hope that will change in the future. But if uh, I know like some distros are very open to new maintainers taking new packages, if you want to take it on yourself, just feel free, you will get my full support. So the next question, Wayne asks, can we use both approaches, approaches which would allow a longer system call list during runtime and then more restricted list during the main code? This is a good idea, actually. I haven't thought about that, maybe. Uh, in its current implementation, probably no, because uh, both tools are like reading the same environment variable. So if you like define a, a probably to define different second policies, you probably need to define different environment variables. So maybe future releases, we will consider to uh, changing the environment variable. And like if lib sandbox will use one set of environment variables, but 
uh, sandboxify tool, we use a different set of environment variables, maybe that would be possible. Although, keep in mind that you, if you like have a sandbox policy, a second policy in force, the only thing you can do it is you can tighten it more. So, and you also have to remember to allow the SACCOM system call itself in your initial policy. Okay, so next one. Thomas asks how to include in things like Go and Rust to use uh, dynamic, uh, li dynamic libraries, probably. So, again, because you're linking the library and the code at runtime, it doesn't matter. So, I definitely know Go has, uh, like, by default, has a quite sophisticated uh, system determining, like, whether when you compile your code, whether the output binary will be dynamically or statically linked. Most of the time, if you use some operating system services, especially within networking or domain resolution, you will get a dynamic binary. If you don't use them, you might get a static binary. Uh, also, if you compile a Go application with CGO disabled, you most likely to get a static binary. I know Rust by default produces dynamic link binary, so just you can check it with LDD common if you have a dynamic or static link binary on your output and just decide which approach to use. Okay, Yenka Traman, uh, sorry if I didn't pronounce your name properly, asks if can we filter system calls based on uh, parameter value? Yes, the general uh, SACCOM system call, because basically all the rules boils down to BPF programs. It's technically possible to write a BPF program which basically filters, uh, provides decision based not only on the system calls themselves, but also the past in parameter values. Although the current library and the system D a thing doesn't support it. So if you want that approach, you probably would have to write your own uh, code yourself, like your own BPF specific to your specific application. So Emily asks, Probably, how are you collecting a list of system calls for common programs to run under Sandboxify? So there is there are like two approaches. The simpler approach is if you just have access to the system and you have a common line tool you want to sandbox, you can run it under a trace and it has a flag which just like count all the system calls the application uses and then it will form a basis of your policy. For more complex applications, from our experience, because you don't exercise the all execution path of a complex application, you will probably get an incomplete list. So for production, that's the reason we included this permissive mode, where a, a variable which allows you to instruct the kernel not to terminate the application, but just log the system call. So for production services, we put the service, the new service, into like this so-called permissive mode first, and then our log and metrics collecting system collects these logs within like days, and then we analyze these logs and compile the initial list of all the uh, system calls we need to allow. That's basically why the discovery mode or the permissive mode is in the code in the first place. Yeah, I think we, uh, we have another list of Question, sorry. Okay, so Jason asks, how does tech com uh, sandboxify limit exactly while it needs to use it to execute the subject binary? I urge you to look into the code. So basically, in the newer kernels, uh, you can run the child process under ptrace and uh, temporarily suspend the second filtering. Uh, 
So this is our main difference from system B. So system B just uh, spawns the child process, uh, sets, up, sets up the second policy and does the exec V. So we spawn the child process temporarily under P trace, uh, then set up the second policy and suspend the second rule processing under P, uh, before uh, doing the exact V, and we also put a break, break point on the exit of the exact V system call. So we basically continue the child execution of the child post, uh, process, then uh, hit the break point uh, when the process executed the exact V but didn't return uh, to, to the main code yet, and then we resume the second rules processing and just continue running the application. So it's uh, it's just basically uh, one step forward from the system D approach. So this is how we're able to actually block any system call, including the exact V. Okay, uh, Renato asks, is it possible to change allowed or block system call uh, during the runtime? Uh, yes, but you can only tighten the uh, policy and you also have to remember to allow the stack comp system call in the first place in your initial policy because if you block it, you cannot do any further stack comp system call. But, uh, if you don't block it, you can then add more rules to the system and the resulting sandbox will be combined, a combination like an, in, of your previous policy plus your new rules. So you cannot loosen it, you can only tighten it. Vasily asks, what is the license? Uh, I have to double check on that. And thanks for pointing this out. So Emily asks, what happens when you try to use the tool to sandbox an executable that declares its own second sandbox? Uh, this is the same what I mentioned before. So basically, if your initial policy will allow, allow the second system call itself, the code will able to further sandbox itself. If uh, and the resulting sandbox will be a tighter combination of the both. If you prohibit the SACCOM system call from the beginning, the application will be just terminated when it tries to sandbox itself. Okay, uh, I think we're out of questions. Here, uh, we can continue the chat in the Q&A room. Uh, so we can chat in the uh, Q&A, uh, in the Slack room, which is called uh, number two track Linux system. So I, I'm waiting for you there. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation and and basically that's it, see you online and uh, waiting for your contributions and feedback on the sandbox tool. Thank you. <laughs>